Prior to the 18th century, Western views on Earth history were defined through literal interpretation of the Bible. And this led to the development of an area of philosophy called natural theology that attempted to interpret Earth history in the light of natural phenomena. By the end of the 18th century, science had begun to uncover flaws in the biblical account. So this is the famous cave at Kirkdale. When I first visited here, the workmen had broken through a stalagmitic crust and uncovered a trove of bones underneath. At first I thought the bones were the victims of the Great Flood, washed into the cave as the waters receded. But after I returned to Oxford and examined them in more detail, I found they'd all been chewed by hyenas like this one. Clearly the hyenas were living in the cave. The following year, 1822, lead miners sinking a shaft near Worksworth in Derbyshire broke into a natural cavern that was largely filled with sand and gravel. As they began to clear the cavern, they encountered the bones of a large animal. Informed of the discovery by the local clergy, Buckland hurried to the site now called Dream Mine, arriving in January 1823. The bones proved to be those of a woolly rhinoceros, almost complete and in an excellent state of preservation. Oh, well done, my good man. Well done. We'll have to remove this. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll give it a try. Bigger. A big go. Larger than the cow, I think. Here's the bone. Look at this, my dear. Can I hold it? Mm -hmm. Whereas the Kirkdale fauna seemed to preserve a warm climate ecosystem, the dream mine woolly rhino pointed to a much colder environment. What began to emerge was a picture of an ancient British history in which great changes in climate and fauna had come and gone. Okay, got the lid. Yeah. In 1837, Louis Agassiz presented his theory of a global ice age to a scientific meeting in Switzerland. Within three years, Buckland had adopted the glacial theory as an explanation for all manner of natural phenomenon that he had previously attributed to the great biblical flood. Here at the Norbera Erratics, the origin of these 
peculiar rocks became apparent. These large blocks of sandstone originated high up on the hill were carried down to their present locations riding on glacial ice. As the ice melted, the sandstone blocks were set down on the limestone bedrock. Thousands of years, erosion have removed, whittled away the limestone, leaving these pedestals with the sandstone above. In the mid-19th century, Buckland and his contemporaries could infer great age in the cave deposits, but they had no way to actually date them. By the late 19th century, Buckland's intellectual successor, William Boyd Dawkins, attempted to estimate the rate at which stalagmites grow in caves. And the site that he chose for his observations was here at Ingleborough Cave in Yorkshire. Boyd Dawkins examined a well-known stalagmite named the Jockey's Cap and carefully measured the distance from the top of the formation to the roof where the drip originated. Between the first measurement taken by the cave's owner, Mr. Farrer, in 1837 and a last measurement taken in 1873, Boyd Dawkins calculated a growth rate of about 7 mm per year. From 1873 to the end of the 20th century, the inferred growth rate was much lower, only about a tenth of a millimetre per year. These measurements led Boyd Dawkins to suppose that Jockey's cap might be only a few millennia old, but he also realised that growth rates of stalagmites were highly variable. The eventual solution to dating Buckland's cave deposits would have to wait until the late 20th century, with the advent of radiometric dating technologies. We now know that Jockey's cap is about 69,000 years old. Today, we do have the ability to date cave deposits, and that is through tiny amounts of decay products from naturally occurring low levels of uranium. This is the uppermost layer of cave deposits. It's a relatively soft calcite laid down about 4,000 to 10,000 years ago in a climate that was similar to today. Before that was considerably colder, Britain was just emerging from a cold glacial time. So the, the clays under here, they incorporate bones of hyenas, of wolf, of bison, of cold climate species that lived in Britain during the time something like 50,000 to 20,000 years ago. Working downwards in sequence and backwards in time, we find these beautiful thick layers of calcite flowstone. Now during this time the cave was not open for animals to come in, but it certainly was open for drip waters to lay down the calcite. The dating shows that this was actually three different interglacial warm periods. The dates are roughly 120,000 years, 220,000 years, and 320,000 years ago. We're now in the deepest part and the oldest part. It's at least 420,000 years ago. Now, Britain had just come out of a very cold glacial, one of the coldest ones of the last million years. This part where I now am had been full of mud, it was dug out, of course, and the only bit left at the top, it shows that there were bones of the enormous and now extinct cave bear. In the later years of his life, William Buckland advocated for the construction of a Museum of Natural History at Oxford. Founded in 1860, four years after his death, today the Oxford University Museum of Natural History is home to internationally important collections, including many of Buckland's own specimens. Today, as we contemplate Britain's future in the face of a rapidly changing climate, we are remarkably fortunate in having a rich record of past climate change preserved in our caves. 
The work begun by Buckland and extended by Pengelly, Boyd Dawkins and others continues today through the efforts of cave scientists who bring increasingly sophisticated technologies and insights to unravelling the details of our shifting climate.